love that Charlie referenced that today is a day of joy since it's a day that we light the purple candle. We decided this year to go for a little more liturgical depth and have a pink candle for the third Sunday in Advent, the Sunday of joy. I grew up with a pink candle in my Advent wreath on this third Sunday, and some of you might be familiar with it, some of you might not, but I read an article this week that referenced it as the Barbie candle, and that gave me a lot of joy. So, even as we dive into this day of joy in this season of Advent, we do so mindful that it is very different from happiness, that there's a lot going on in our world that is heartbreaking, and it is in places far away, and it is close by in our own lives. Our scripture passage today is one that we have touched upon over these past few weeks, but I always think it's important to read the entirety of Mary's Magnificat every Advent, and today is that day. So let me set the scene for us a little bit. Right before this, the angel Gabriel has come to Mary to let her know she's going to have a child by the Holy Spirit, no big deal. And so immediately, not surprisingly, Mary rushes off to be with her cousin Elizabeth, who is also pregnant with who will become John the Baptist. And our scripture tells us that when they see each other, it's a happy reunion, and the baby in Elizabeth, Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy, and Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. And then Mary breaks out into this song, the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise. I also like it because I like musicals, and you know, in musicals, people are always breaking out into song, so I kind of picture this like that. So this comes from Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lonely, lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his child Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You might have seen this really difficult story. There's been a lot of difficult stories, you might say. So which one? Well, I don't remember if it was last week or the week before, but a church in Bethlehem placing a baby Jesus among rubble in their nativity scene representing the devastation of the current Israel-Hamas war. It's called the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, and they use this display to symbolize the destruction of the communities in Gaza. Baby Jesus lies swaddled in a kafia. I have an image of this for you to see. 
the distinctive pattern of the Palestinian scarf surrounded by stones. You'll see the wise men are still there, kind of along the sides, the shepherds, there's animals along the bottom. The community, the church community, built this together. The pastor of the church, Reverend Munther Isaac, says, while the world celebrates Christmas with big festivities, in the homeland of Christmas, children are being killed, homes are being destroyed, and families displaced. So we wanted to remind the world of the suffering, the injustice that we go through, so it can hopefully challenge the world to work for peace. It's a difficult image, but as it's Christmas, he said, we also have kept a burning light inside the nativity scene to show hope. And we have a closer up image of that as well. Reverend Isaac said there could be no Christmas celebrations in Palestine this year. People are broken and sad and afraid. He said it's impossible to celebrate with what's happening in Gaza. There will be no street parades, no Christmas lights, nothing this year. Everything will be confined to prayers in churches only. Meanwhile, Israelis are lighting the menorah in Jerusalem, surrounded by images of hostages, and we learned the tragic story this week of three of those hostages killed accidentally by the Israeli military. The stories shared by hostages that were recently released are just gut-wrenching, and critics are raging back and forth and screaming over each other, and casualties are growing every day, and it's made more complicated by competing claims on who is more at fault. And even here in L.A., our Jewish community is afraid, afraid to celebrate Hanukkah publicly, afraid to display menorahs, afraid to wear their Hanukkah sweaters around because of very real threats of violence. It's a humanitarian crisis, a political crisis, and a tragedy of immeasurable proportion. How is the next generation being killed or traumatized? And who are the winners and who are the losers when there is so much death and destruction? How can we even compare suffering? It's a black hole with no end. The baby found in the rubble could represent many places of conflict around the world. The baby Jesus as a hostage. The baby Jesus caught in the civil war in Sudan. The baby Jesus born into the front lines of this ongoing war in Ukraine. The baby Jesus born on the streets of Los Angeles, unhoused hungry, insecure. I remember a few years ago, a church made U.S. headlines when they put their lawn nativity in a cage to highlight the families and children that were being put in immigration detention centers. The idea that God came to earth to be with the poor and the oppressed is not new. And it goes back generations to this amazing song of praise sung by Mary when she is greeted by Elizabeth and the baby in Elizabeth's womb recognizes the power of God literally within Mary being held and carried and nourished by her. It's a far cry from the shiny and sparkly societal expectations of Christmas that focus on consumerism, Santa, as much as I love the guy, and these delightfully cheesy movies. It's a far cry from elaborate Christmas parties and outrageous decorations and perfectly wrapped gifts and all these unrealistic expectations we have for things to be perfect and for everyone to behave, especially our relatives. 
Have you all seen that show? I saw it on Disney Plus a few weeks ago, and I couldn't stop watching it. It's called The Great Christmas Light Fight. It's where families compete for the most elaborate and kind of insane Christmas decorations on their lawns and houses. I mean, as fun as it is, I kind of wonder, have we taken it too far? How far is too far? And with the rise of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia around the world, it can be understandably challenging to find meaning and hope this season, or at least a little, I don't know, jarring, maybe disingenuous. I had to look up that word to see if I was using it correctly, and I'm still not 100%, but I don't know. Are any of you struggling with that stark contrast of war and violence with the holiday glitter? Even the Lutheran Church in Bethlehem has a candle lit next to baby Jesus in their nativity of rubble to symbolize the hope of the season. But isn't that what the season of Advent and Christmas is all about? I mean, really, not that Jesus comes to turn our lives into a shiny Hallmark movie, but that Jesus comes to walk alongside us in this dumpster fire. That's what I love about the Magnificat, that Mary is so powerfully calling out the disparity of powerful and oppressed and rich and hungry. She cries out that the world is on fire, yet God remembers God's people and will not abandon us, and will not forsake us, will not leave us alone and in darkness. We portray Mary so often as this beatific figure with a smiling face and a pretty blue dress, but, I mean, who was she really? Certainly a strong, faithful, courageous woman, We were laughing in Advent Bible study last week, wondering if the angel Gabriel had other virgins on his list who'd all said, no thanks, prior to Mary saying, okay, I'll do it. Catholic priest Robert Maloney says that the historical Mary experienced poverty, oppression, violence, and the execution of her son. Her faith is deeply rooted in that context. Before the omnipotent God, she recognizes her own lowly estate. She is not among the world's powerful. She is simply God's maidservant. But she believes that nothing is impossible for God. In the Magnificat, she sings confidently that God rescues life from death, joy from sorrow, light from darkness. Mary, as a biblical figure, is an awesome character of great import in the birth narrative. And yet she does not focus on herself in her Magnificat, but she draws our attention to God and to God's power and to the greatness and goodness of God and God's promises to us. It's all about what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will continue to do in the world that God so loves. How do we make room for Jesus this season in this dumpster fire? Perhaps it's not only a practice of making room for what will come, but acknowledging what already is. Many of you met my, a mentor of mine, Catherine, in July when she was here to preach for us. And many of you met her son, George. Every year, 
George uses his Playmobil figures to make a nativity as a central focus of their Christmas decorations. He's been doing it since he was a little boy, and he's now 30. So here is George in his Venom t-shirt with his entire Playmobil set, which includes the nativity and probably every other figure that he owns. And you'll see in this close-up that baby Jesus is there, kind of center left, with Mary and Joseph, but everybody else is there too. It includes the police car, the dump truck, the construction workers, there's tools, there's traffic cones. They're all present and accounted for. We have a few more pictures. See, they're all there. The animals are there. There's a train in the back right behind the wise, the wise men. There's a helicopter. Everybody is there. This year, their family's advent, Catherine and George, has been saddened by the news that one of George's childhood friends died at the age of 27. And a couple of days after Felipe's death, that was George's friend, Felipe, his mother saw the pictures of George's nativity on social media because Catherine had shared them on social media for their community. And this was her post under the image of this nativity scene. She said, the first thing that came to my mind is that Jesus is there, right in the midst of our chaos, right in the middle of it. That message is a gift. Friends, the challenges of our time are very real. And the hope we have in the coming of Jesus is not meant to erase our suffering, but to reassure us that Jesus is coming to be here with us in the middle of all of it. Jesus was born in the chaos. Jesus came to save us in the midst of our chaos. Jesus does not leave us alone in the midst of our chaos, but Jesus came to this dumpster fire to be with us. That's the meaning of Emmanuel. God with us. In the words of Christian author Meredith Miller, Christmas is not here to offer a four-week escape from the pain of the world with a paper-thin layer of twinkle lights. It's not here to anesthetize us with bows and eggnog lattes. Christmas is not offering us the chance to escape the ache of life through piles of presents. Christmas is God saying, yes, this pain is too much. Yes, it is too sad. Yes, the ache is too great. Hang on. I'll come carry it with you. May it be so. Amen.